learning. <laughs> um, so I need to ask you about a couple other things. So she asked me if I was interested, and at the same time she said, well, you know, I'm playing at Town Hall in New York City at the same time. And I remember very vividly, I went to see you at Town Hall. I had not heard any of the songs. And you were playing with Stuart Smith. Now, do you all know who Stuart Smith is? And I didn't really know that much about Stuart. And I went to the show, and I was blown away by the whole show, blown away by Roseanne. I was blown away by how incredibly musical Stuart was. I was very impressive, actually quite intimidating, as I'm a guitar player. And um, first of all, how did you meet Stuart? Because Through Rodney. Rodney you know. had, um, he had said, I think I found the guitar player for us. And so we, um, Stuart came to the studio and we were, he played on something on King's Record Shop. And um, I, I couldn't connect with him at first because he was very um, reserved and shy and I was trying and I was going, what's that? And then it suddenly hit me how deeply sensitive he was and that he was kind of over-processing everything. He was great. Um, and kind of prepared you for me, I think. Yes, yeah. over-processing. <laughs> and then did you want me to say that, you know, about the, him playing on the wheel? Well, yeah, so it's, uh, well, it's going to lead us into performing the wheel. Is that okay? Well, Too we soon? will when we finish. I don't uh, know. I'm not keeping um, track of time. Yeah. Well, no. We're good. We're good. Okay. We're good. <clears throat> well, no. Let's play the clip from the. So well, let me just say. So I had written the wheel. I played it for Stuart, and Stuart wrote this guitar part for it. Unbelievable. Unbelievable guitar part. And John, when we went to record the wheel. He got Stuart up to play the part. Well, we I would since, have been an idiot not to. Well, yeah. So we <laughs> since found out in the last 30 years, I have met three people who could play that guitar part. Stuart Smith, Larry Campbell, and a stage tech guy in Sydney, Australia. <laughs> now this is, this is, you have to take this in. This has really been Seriously. a thing for us. So this is 30 years, Stuart plays this incredible finger pick guitar part where player. you have to sustain like this perfect rhythm for three minutes and you, if you falter at all the entire thing falls apart. Falls apart. Sorry. Just, and, oh, sorry. and we've only found, I mean Larry did an okay job. We <laughs> love Larry. He's not here. I didn't hear the stage hand in Australia. It was good. But Stuart nails it and it's just been torture for 30 years to play this song because nobody can play it. I tried to learn it, and I spent about 40 minutes on it. I said, oh, screw this. I am not doing this because it was so hard to learn. And it, let's play a bit of it so yeah, that you can hear it. Yeah, nice hear it. Can we? Well, <laughs> It goes like that through the whole song. Yeah, yeah. Wow. It's just it's really, really incredible, and so grateful. And we've—I've tried to hire him to come back and play it, but yeah, unfortunately, he's in this band. I don't know. Maybe you've heard of the Eagles. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I guess they're doing okay because he always seems to be. Oh God, I could get with the Eagles. And I'm like, God, oh, okay. Well, your priorities, I guess. <laughs> so um, we were—we made the wheel, the album. Um, it started out very intense. I was completely in love with him, and I had to convince him to be in love with me. And he said I just picked him out of a lineup. He said that I just looked and said, I'll take that poor bastard right here. <laughs> Which is not entirely true. I'm sorry, hey, what, did, what did you just say? No. And, um, I was looking at my notes. Too. By the end of the making the album, we were a couple, and um, are you looking at questions that you made to ask? Well, yeah, we were supposed to have a, a, a journalist interview us, and she couldn't come at the last minute, and John said, I'll interview you, and I said, no. <laughs> and I said, no, I'll be good, and I said, no. <laughs> and yet, here we are. <laughs> All right, I have some good questions here. Maybe we should take some questions from the audience. 
Well, well, here's another question I wanted to ask you. So here you are, you grew up in Southern California, which many people may not know. So you're sort of a Southern California girl, which uh, knowing you the way I do sort of makes sense. But then you, like I say, you have this very solid career here in Nashville and you're so connected to Nashville and all the permutations culturally and musically. My and, daughters are here. Yeah, your daughters, but I'm talking about, and then explain New York City. Explain New York City. So I'm, a, I'm a lifelong New Yorker. What am I doing here is the question we should all be Well, asking. okay, so I um, love the music so much. You know, Merle Haggard on Up and Down. And of course, the, my dad, you know, the, uh, what went in as a child by osmosis. It's part of my DNA. And, but I didn't like being famous. And I didn't like that Nashville sometimes felt like a fishbowl and that um, I was under the microscope. And I um, had nothing to do with my love for the people, the community, or the music. But I just wanted more anonymity. And I always felt a resonance with New York. And I liked the, like, um, uh, like why? How? Why? Because yeah. of the writers I knew, the musicians I knew, the visual artists I knew who were all working at the top of their game because of the cultural advantages. Because I just like that kind of rhythm and home. So all it, this time while you're making these hit records in Nashville and really having a career that people would envy anywhere, I don't care where you are, you were still sort of thinking like... About New York, I would go to New York all the time. So then I, you know, I married a native and it just, it worked out. Um, if I hadn't been from New York, would you have been interested in me? No, I'll tell you what. I'll well, tell let's you say what. I was if from Peoria or uh, if you hadn't had the, suburb of Kansas City. If care. you hadn't <laughs> had the depth of love and understanding of Roots music that you did, I wouldn't have been In other interested. words, if I didn't love George Jones as much as I did, you would <laughs> If you didn't love George Jones George as Jones. much as you did the Beatles and all of that, then right. it would have been difficult for me. But, um, so that's, that's why, that's it. Yeah. But I was just part of the master plan you had to get to New York. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we should take a couple of questions. <laughs> or I'm going to go to these. Yeah. Ah, that's where we <laughs> Seriously. We'll take a couple of questions. Oh, don't be shy. Yes. Who's, oh, yes. Yes, sir. What's the direction for the label? <laughs> That's a guy okay. in the music business. So, during the book, John has vaults of music that he's written that ha hasn't had a home. So during the pandemic, we have a recording studio in our, our townhouse. During the pandemic, he went down and that year or two recorded uh, his first solo album. So he said he knew he wanted to call the album Rumble Strip. And when I started getting my Sony Masters back after 30 years, just this last year, he said, you know, we can, now we own the Masters, we can form a label. And when he said his album called, was going to be called Rumble Strip, I said, that's a great name for the label as well. So the first release is The Wheel, reissue, and the second release after the first year. It's John's first solo album, Rumble Strip. Okay. Yes, sir. So whatever happened to the uh, napkin lyrics? Did that make it into a song? You know what? Uh, she wants to do it, but I don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was uh, Seventh Avenue. Yeah, that's we wrote a song Seventh called Seventh Avenue. Avenue. And that's a good, actually a good record. That's a good track. Do you want to play just a verse of it so he hears oh, it? I have to get in this whole crazy tune. It's so complicated. Oh, you're going to make me do it. I yeah. know you are. <laughs> I'll take another question while you're doing it. <laughs> so yes. Can you tell us your experience with Bob Dylan? These are more important questions. <laughs> tell the experience. Well, don't tell the real experience. <laughs> Let's make up. Um, are you filming this? Yeah. <laughs> One time he showed up outside my apartment and said, 
he called, no, he called and he said, I'm doing this show, you know, I'd like you to sing back upon it, want to play the songs. I said, I'm free Tuesday. He said, I'm downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> so there were several odd experiences like that, which I don't need to go into. But my experience with him is that he's a great artist and a complicated man. And uh, I was very careful. <laughs> <laughs> More and more questions. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm not going to tell them. <laughs> yes, sir, right there. Or now, you can't see. Yes, sir. John, you, sir. Said, you said that you weren't happy with the production of that song. Mm. I was wondering what is it that you weren't happy about and what would you do different now? Well, I have a complicated relationship with happiness in general. <laughs> so that's the foundation of that. Uh, well, the truth is that uh, I was learning my craft. It was maybe the fourth record I had produced. Um, uh, I've now been doing it for, I don't know, 35, 36 years. Um, and it's quite hard for me to go back and listen to things I did back then because I felt I can feel uh, a, a kind of tendency to do too much, to make things too big, too complicated. Um, I think both out of a sense of still searching for the right sort of things to do and uh, this feeling of, oh, let's get all these cool ideas in there, because I had a lot of cool ideas. And I think in, in production, and I have a feeling in pretty much any art, sort of the real task as you go along is to learn what to get rid of. And so you really embrace what's important. And it's, it's, it's challenging. It takes a certain kind of commitment and ultimately some kind of artistic courage to like keep removing things. Mm -hmm. So the distillation of the right idea, you, you, you commit to it. And it takes a kind of deep commitment, if that makes sense. And I hadn't learned that yet. And so it makes me sad that I had. And I was like, why didn't you learn it quicker? I mean, I eventually did, I think. You know, it took a while, but I eventually did. It's like what Miles Davis said, the music is the space between the notes. You know, you have to be confident about going to that place. Yeah, and I'm a, I'm a little bit of a control freak. And like I said, we had a wonderful engineer, Roger Mundo, who I hope is here, so we can say hi. Hi, guys. Uh, Hi, Roger. Hi, Roger. <laughs> and I mean, just great. The record sounds great. It was remastered. I was, it was really sounds great. It, and it just, also just took me a while to understand sonically what it was that I was going for. I just couldn't quite do it. And I was very, very fortunate to work with really great recording engineers early on. And I paid attention to what they were doing so that I could eventually do it because it was just in my nature. I just see it like playing guitar, like being a recording engineer is the same thing. It's just a creative tool to, to make this thing, this uh, record. It takes, so. you know, it takes time to achieve the level of confidence and mastery in what you do. Um, I don't generally like looking back either um, because I hear myself with such a critical ear, I could have sung that better, I should have, that line isn't quite right, you know, you can go down a rabbit hole with it. But there's something happened when I owned this master again and listened to it. I was just so proud of it and I thought that is an accurate reflection of that moment in my life that was as good as I could write for whatever it's worth. <coughs> and that's the record that we had to make then. And I felt proud of it, you know. I think we should play the song The Wheel, because that's why these songs are here, right? Now, I can't play Stewart's guitar part. So I'm going to just play it the way I play stuff, which is... I don't even know what it is, to be honest.
just to know the question is good enough for me. to Jed uh, for letting us kind of kick off the Americana Association. <laughs> thank you to the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum for always feeling like home to me and being so kind and welcoming and for taking such wonderful care of so many of my family's belongings and for giving us this space for today. So thank you, all, everyone there. And for uh, Jed Hilly and the Americana Music Association, which is a beautiful thing. It's given us a little home away from home, yeah. which is nice. Wonderful. Complicated times. And to my daughters for giving up the jackets oh, that they've yeah. given up. And, uh, and for putting get, up with me. Yeah. I'm going to get the rest of them someday. <laughs> so I think we'll end this by doing a song even older than the wheel. We'll end by um, doing Seven Year Eight. <laughs>
Everybody's talking, but you don't hear a thing. Still uptown on old, you down here and swing. Boulevard's empty, why don't you come around? Maybe what is so great about sleeping downtown? There's plenty of times to be someone you're not. Just say you're looking for something you might have forgot. Don't bother calling to say you're leaving alone. There's a fool on every corner when you try 